What are you talking about? This is the cold open, Neil. If this open was any colder, Jose, it'd be in a graveyard. Oh my goodness. 104. We're on episode 104. So I'm looking at the script and I'm not expecting anyone to jump in at all and disturb my conversation with you at all. <laughs> Which is, I love how we're just all leaving Jose out to dry. No one's like jumping in to help out. No, we're just like, we're just letting him die on this hill. <laughs> <laughs> hey, oi. Hey, hey. Why didn't you fuckers tell me there was a new Deadpool movie out? There's a new Deadpool movie out? Oh. Hi and welcome to the We Need Roads Dead Pod. I'm your host, Mr. Paradox, but you can call me Neil because it's my day job to keep the sacred podcast timeline under two hours, otherwise you could destroy all known universes and make David late for bed. And today we're going to be talking the film of the summer and probably some of my co-hosts' film of the year, and that is Deadpool and Wolverine. Firstly, I'm joined by a man who can now finally acknowledge the existence of this film after curling up into a spoiler-free cocoon for the whole year. Yes, it's the one and only Ben Paul. How's it going, mate? Have you been in any pools recently? Oh, mate, you've known me long enough that I've been in every pool. And a bit disturbing. Next, we have everyone's <laughs> favourite team member, and we need a road podcast, the very own Sugar Bear Peter, a.k.a. Mr. Jose Lopez. Oh, I'm the favourite? What? That's that's kind of a compliment. You're definitely the Sugar Bear. You're definitely Aww. Sugar Bear. It's, it's, it's only because of the facial hair and because you're just so damn nice, Jose. Oh, yeah, and I have the piercings too. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> <laughs> Next up, a man who will soon be raising a child, just like Logan on X-23, we have our very own David Longarine. Longarine. Oh, David, Ooh. with a child on the way, you need to look out for, say it, Ben. Baby knife. <laughs> <laughs> I'll give them a little... Is it okay to give a little child, like a little baby, a knife just to do that? It is now. Yeah, it'll be... it's, that's socially acceptable, right? Just tweet what Ryan Reynolds will make it final, right? Somehow. <laughs> and finally, we have our very own Marvel Jesus and friend of the pod making his first appearance on the We Need a Rose podcast, Mr. Robert Stewart, who knows a thing or two about comic book movies from his podcast, The Stew World Order. How's it going, Stu? It's going very well. Thank you so much for having me. I can't believe I've never been on before. That's wild. Especially as we have a roster of about seven people who come on now. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think with, with, like you say, with your podcast, Stew World Order, it's planned. You're like months advancing ahead. With us, it's, what did you see yesterday? Oh, let's do a podcast on it. And suddenly <laughs> four hours disappear. Yeah, with a dumpster fire, a podcast. <laughs> I have currently recorded and scheduled up through, I think, the first or second week of November. Oh, wow. wow. See, you guys, wow, see you guys, that's, that's what I've been trying to do. You've been doing a poor job of it, Neil. I mean, you know, he is hurting. <laughs> yeah, try harder. Yeah, right. come on. <laughs> but Stuart, first of all, tell us about your podcast, Stu World Order. So the Stu World Order is my podcast. We review random comic book movies with a different guest every single episode. The movies are drawn from a big uh, a pool I have of comic book movies, movies based on graphic novels. And we give every movie our ups, our downs, and then our overall rating out of 10. Uh, if you want to hear me on it, I've already been, I can't remember the episode numbers, but I know I was there talking about The Suicide Squad and also Constantine. And yeah, love Constantine. It holds up really, really well. I was surprised how much I still liked Constantine. I expected that movie to age a little poorly, but it was good. It was very good. And of course, hopefully we've got a new one on the way with Keanu coming back again. But before we dive headfirst into Deadpool and Wolverine, that sounds bad as well, but we have to talk the big Marvel news coming straight from Hall H at Comic-Con on the day before, when it was announced that firstly, the Russo brothers are back to direct the next two Avengers films, Avengers mm -hmm. Doomsday and Avengers Secret Wars, finally confirming that yes, Kang died on his way back to his own planet. Hey, Having Ant-Man beat him looks like a masterstroke now in retrospect, doesn't it? It does. Does it? Does anything in that movie look like a masterstroke? I mean, <laughs> not even Bill Murray was a masterstroke in that movie, and that's like sacrilege out of my own mouth. How do you waste a Bill Murray cameo? I'd already forgotten Bill Murray was even in that movie. Actually, I forgot See? too. I was going to say, Bill Murray was in yep. that film? <laughs> Bill Murray has forgotten he was in that film, let's be honest. Probably for the best. But gentlemen, the big reveal on a stage full of Doctor Dooms as he removed his mask, it was only... Bloody Robert Downey Jr. returning to the MCU to play Doctor Doom. Gentlemen. Fake news, and... fake news, fake news. Jose, just because you're from Florida. 
<laughs> Florida burn. Nice. Uh, gentlemen, I, I need your thoughts on this seismic news. And as he's our guest, let's start off with you, Stu. Uh, you know what? I know a lot of people are down on this, but my thought is if they didn't have a plan, they wouldn't be doing this. So I I believe in the Russos. I believe in Kevin Feige. I'm going to give this a pass until I see what they're actually doing with it because it's it's too weird and it's too out of left field for them to not have something in mind, a plan, a reason that they've cast Robert Downey Jr. So I believe in them. I'm going to give them the benefit of the doubt and see where they're going with it and ben uh i'd like to think that you're absolutely right there Stu, but i just feel like they're they're like scrabbling now to like to win fans back after what have been a really just mediocre turnout and a really like poor showing of what the marvel universe like if you compare it to what the marvel universe has been all of a sudden they've lost their way oh, kevin feige said that he used covid to read all the scripts uh, of the projects they've got coming up, and that he cancelled a lot of them because it was trash. So, do you mean the writer strike? Oh, I mean the writer strike. Sorry, yes, not COVID. God sake, COVID still seared into my brain. But thank you, Jose. Um, yeah, so he used the writer strike to read all those scripts, and then when uh, no, I'm going to cancel a lot of these, uh, which tells you the state of the MCU. Like the man that had his finger firmly on a pulse now does not have his finger inside himself in a good way. <laughs> <laughs> <clears throat> and from no i'm not even making a dodgy segue for that david what did you think <laughs> uh i was similar to to ben i think the state of the mcu leading up to the avengers was really poor and there was no real hype level uh there was no investment from fans into what was happening for these two avengers films and then the second but the, they just changed that they changed the mood they changed the conversation in one in one moment on stage you know in one twitter post in one whatever and then, bam! All of a sudden, you're interested again because Robert Downey Jr. is in it. And how? And like, like uh, Stu said, they obviously they must have a plan for it. So anybody speaking negatives, Jose, uh, can, <laughs> can can just shut up because I believe, yeah, there's there's a plan. I, I think they needed they needed to market it, and I think it's it's, it's marketed in one in one hit. Nice, Jose. So I'd like to clarify, uh, I'm not against RDJ being uh, Dr. Doom. I just don't think that's the long-term goal. This is obviously, I think, the what a lot of people will agree is most likely a variant. And I think by the time that we get to uh, Secret Wars, once that ends up, I feel like there might be a two-movie arc where he is, is Dr. Doom. But uh, I think ultimately we're going to come to who will be the 616 variant and be the the main villain in that respect. But I'm I'm excited to see him back. It is kind of bittersweet that he's not Iron Man, but it would be interesting to see him as a villain. Um, but uh, yeah, I, th- I think that this is is this is not a long term goal for him to be Doom. That's what I'm saying. Hmm, I don't know. He, he well, he finished his run of movies, then went off, got an Oscar. I mean, he did Doolittle, but let's not mention <laughs> Doolittle. Got his Oscar, <laughs> and then. Uh, he- He's back to a yeah. That's that's we got this. It definitely wasn't a film about the atomic bomb. And now he's back to doing all the films for all the big cashes, uh, truck of money again. So does he, does he uh, need the money? Like, do you spend that kind of money on Robert Downey Jr. and that and have him as like a like a like a misdirect? Are they spending that kind of money? Are oh, they just come on, kind of helping him out. Help, oh, what? Help him out. <laughs> yeah, help yeah. the multi millionaire. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, because people people with that much money are known to just fucking help out in a multi million pound <laughs> dollar movie. No yeah. chance. Now, nah, if there's whatever, what, what do we think? Like eighty million, roughly, for what? Like his. We'll pay, find out. Pay pay oh, he's he's a hundred million oh. if he's a day, and a plus whatever his back end <laughs> yeah. is. Honestly, like his back end like, has got to be fucking unreal. Like he's like he's one of the most like he's like one of the richest actors in Hollywood because of those Marvel movies. So like, I don't see that. I don't see him coming back unless it's for an enormous payday, and that he gets to basically call the shots on what he does. Because why else do it? And if you're playing something, you're playing someone like Doctor Doom. I mean. You've got to go from one of the most beloved characters now in the MCU to like, and you've really got to like, like he's really got to dive in. You can't half ass it. He he's has got to murder someone horribly. Like, oh really yeah, he's got on. he's got to take. Like, I mean, he's probably going to kill Anthony Mackie's Captain America because no one seems to give a Ooh. fuck about that movie right now. 
So like, <laughs> like I mean, like I'm all for it. I think that's a really great choice. And the, and the arc actually, and like the um, the um, the arc in the comics where like the, where his character becomes uh, Captain America is fucking excellent. So like to have like to have that on screen, I'm quite excited about. But no one else gives a fuck about it. And I don't know if it's like a race thing. So you don't want to see a black Captain America, which is kind of bullshit or 100 percent bullshit. If it's uh, if it's just a like a um, uh, a pushback against like Chris Evans because he was Captain America to everybody and they don't you, you, like change is difficult for people. Doesn't matter like, who it is, yeah. Yeah, it doesn't matter who it is, which is again bullshit because you know, why not? Like it happens in the comics, that's cool. And then like y- you've got that kind of those kind of pushbacks, and then you've got the pushback against this, which is like what I was trying to get to my point to start with there. Like you've got <laughs> one of the most beloved characters in the MCU becoming probably one of the most like he's got a, he he either it has to be the very the, the next best thing to Thanos, or he's fucked. I, I read a little article today where people were saying that um, there's a there's like one of the famous comics, and they had the, the panels of it where like he's some version of Doctor Doom, and he basically kills Thanos. Oh yeah, like, rips his spine all, out. He's all in all white, and he asks, "Do you have the Infinity Gauntlet?" And he's like, "No, but I'm still a threat." And I was like. Poof. Rips the spine out, and it's like amazing. I saw that panel; it's wonderful. But here's here's my so we could get that on screen. Yeah, here's my reason why RDJ. Yes, he's going to be paid, but like that's why he probably won't last. Is he's charging too much to be able to be Doctor Doom, and I think he's going to transition to the real Doctor Doom in the next mm. couple of films. I nah. don't know. I think it's. I think two, he's they're back two for Avengers that. movies. They're going to make billions and millions of dollars. <laughs> Like that, like that whole movie is probably going to cost them. Like, I mean, like, like seriously, what they're going to spend on that movie? One hundred fifty million dollars, like, to make that thing. Like, seriously, like, and they'll most of that's going to be back and Robert Downey Jr. is going to take most of that money, and then they'll, then they'll just film it in Canada where it's cheap as fuck, and they'll be, you know, like, <laughs> and then they'll be like, yeah, great, we just we just won all the awards and we got all the money. We made a bit the, the, the first movie to make ten billion dollars at the box office. Oh man. <laughs> Honestly, I think that there really is just an opportunity to find a, a be- another actor, and a lot of people are saying Killian Murphy. I don't think again, Jose. Um, so, like, I'm fairly confident in this way. I think if you look at the Russos, Danny Jr. and Feige's track record of working together, they have made some of the best comic book movies of all time and created just in, you know memorable cinema going experiences for whole generations. So, I think the pro with this is that this I think this will work. Obviously, there are a ton of questions like: Is this going to be a variant of Doctor Doom, or is it? And he just looks like Tony Stark, or is he a Tony Stark that becomes a Doctor Doom? Like, and there's all the different versions of this from the comics that they can draw from. I bet you Tom Holland right now is planning his Oscar clip reaction phase when he sees Tony, you're alive, and then he doom Tony does something really fucking disturbing. Oscar clip was a bit far, but I could just I could just imagine Tom Holland like you know crying and it's like <laughs> when you watch Ronaldo in a football match, all you want to do is see him cry on the pitch. So all I want to see now is that is that I want to see that scene where Tom Holland gets the reveal of Tony and he's like, Tony, how? And then he just does something horrible to him and then he starts crying. Out or, you know, potentially murders Spider Man. That could happen. And if it could happen in these films, we don't know. Conzo, is this Marvel basically admitting they were wrong with most of the last phase and what they tried with terms of star story and direction? And they simply like going back to the safest choice possible. It's you know the break glass in case of emergency uh, best of team here. Right, we get the directors who made the most money. We get the stars who banked the most money in the films. Uh, I've, I also I did hear a rumour that uh, Jackman is going to be involved in these ones as well. He's like, definitely, I want to be involved with that shit. So Jackman could be along. That's only fair if Ryan Reynolds is in it. I saw a post saying that uh, both, both Ryan Reynolds and Hugh Jackman want to be in a movie with Tom Holland as Spider-Man. Of course. That, that you're going to have him. Thor's got to cry at something. Yeah. And uh, there was a rumor about uh, Maguire, Toby Maguire Spider Man coming back for it as well. So uh, yeah, there were rumors initially that uh, Jackman and Maguire were going to be the big stars of Secret Wars. I don't know whether that's going to be true, but I've heard those rumors also. That'd be great. Jackman's going to be seven hundred years old. <laughs> hey, he'll be doing it till he's ninety. <laughs> till he's ninety. Yep. Yes. Just like R. Um, RDJ. I think it's now time to get into the main event, and that is Deadpool and Wolverine. So first, this is a spoiler podcast, everyone. So feel free to. Spoil everything. And if you're listening and you haven't seen it, then why? Go and see it. Go and see it two or three times. Then come back and listen to it. Because hopefully then some of this will make more sense to you. Yeah, check out the box office. If you if you haven't seen it, you're the only one. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and definitely don't listen to this if you haven't seen it. So firstly, a quick plot summary. And as you know, guys, when I've done these in the past, they are very quick. And you're like, but you left that out. You left that out. Yes, because we're going to talk about all that stuff later. So... We catch up with a depressed Wade Wilson having a midlife crisis as he works on, alongside Sugar Bear, a.k.a. Peter, as a car salesman. Not you, Jose. Put your fist down. He tries and fails to even get an audience to join the Avengers using Cable's time time device to come to Earth 616. 
but he was rejected by Happy Hogan. Also, Vanessa has left him because he's a massive loser now. He's got bad hair and he's retired from Deadpooling. Then, at his birthday, the TVA turn up to recruit Wade and Mr. Paradox. He's a villain because he's English. All Deadpool villains are English. Uh, even Eddie Marsan's character, who was American, playing American in Deadpool 2, is an English actor. But he offers him a spot as a hero on Earth-616. Wade's totally up for this until he finds out that his universe and everyone he knows is going to die really soon because his universe's Wolverine is dead and is something cool, important called an anchor being. Not a fan, Wade steals Paradox's tempad with a plan to find any Wolverine and bring them to save his universe. Naturally, this doesn't go well and Wade recruits the worst Wolverine from the timelines. His plan doesn't work, Paradox prunes them both, and they get sent to the Void. The Void is run by Cassandra Nova, Professor X's evil twin sister, who is immensely powerful, and the only way Wade and Logan can get home to save Deadpool's universe is through her. That's the broad strokes of the plot, because we know what's going to happen. We know that Wade and Logan are going to save the day. And there's going to be lots of swearing and brutal violence. So, everyone, initial reactions to the film. Stu, let's hit this. Uh, I really liked it. It's exactly what it purports to be in that it's just a lot of fun. It's just a lot of cameos. A lot that I truly did not expect whenever I went into it. Just the, the characters that you see in this movie, I did not think that I would see in it. It's a ton of fun. My biggest letdown for the movie is... I believe Feige lied to us because he told us that this movie was going to have huge ramifications through the rest of the MCU. And it does not. It does not at all. Not not the way it's portrayed. I mean, I guess they could do more with it going forward. But I was expecting this to have ramifications on the sacred timeline on the real MCU and the way it's set up. It's it's simply not going to not the way it ends. But the road there is a ton of fun and there's a lot of laughs and my wife laughed until she cried at certain parts in the movie. So you can't go wrong with that. If if I can find comic book movies that my wife really enjoys, that's uh, that's as good as you're going to get. <laughs> that is the best recommendation you can get right there. Uh, ben, <laughs> well, we know, we know. Best movie ever! <laughs> <laughs> uh, it was wicked. It was so good. Like, I haven't laughed that much at a movie in ages. I think from about halfway on, I didn't stop laughing. Like, I just chuckled. There was, like, tears running down my face. It was so funny. It hits It hits every single, um, like, aspect that I wanted it to hit. Like, and being a huge fan of the Deadpool comics from back in the day, like, it was the, it was the movie to me that felt most like a Deadpool comic. Like, it was, like, like, it was, it was weird, and it, like, it had, like, almost too much, uh, like, fourth wall breaking, but then, it, like, then all, all of a sudden, it, like, didn't have enough, and it was, it was just everything that I loved about the comics, as well as what I loved about the first two movies, and, like, if you, if, if there was anything that, like, I had to, uh, like, say that was off about it, it was the initial pacing for me, like, the very first, like, 20 minutes or so after the um after the dance fight scene like that little bit of pacing there when he's like then when they're trying to like desperately tell you who the tva are and why they're important and why this whole movie can happen they had to squeeze so, like the whole of loki two seasons into like you know 20 minutes which proves how worthwhile that series was but that um after they managed that and like it takes off you're just like it's just it's a riot and it's yeah i mean everything that I wanted a surprise movie to be. Awesome. David. Uh, it was the most enjoyable thrill ride from start to finish for me. I haven't had that much fun at the cinema in years. And like Stu, my wife was laughing at it from start to finish. And she doesn't like MCU movies. She doesn't like superhero movies like at all, really. She finds them quite, but I was surprised she didn't fall asleep. <laughs> <laughs> but she was laughing at it like throughout the whole thing and i i for, yeah for an experience cinema experiences for me have been diminishingly diminishing slowly and progressively and i've found myself enjoying it less and less and this just really just hammered it back home for me i loved it awesome awesome always good yeah. to hear man uh jose i have no idea what you're gonna say jose yeah i actually fell asleep halfway through I'm kidding. I'm kidding. <laughs> You're banished. <laughs> going to send you to the void. I actually had a, like, I think everyone, we, we had a great time seeing all the cameos. And something I honestly didn't expect was with, um, I saw interviews with Ryan Reynolds talking about characters. And I'm like, okay, yes, he does a good job of making sure the characters are taken care of. But there were some genuine moments where I was just like taken aback 
the the quality of of the moment that each character had like the fireplace with deadpool and x23 oh no wolverine and x23 and then even like as cheesy as it was at the end where they hailed hands to take the force the the brunt of the the whatever was going on going through their veins and um you know you had hugh jackman finally come take his shirt off but like that moment was really kind of like i was like oh wow this is it's kind of hitting the shirt off moment the shirt off moment yeah i thought so. <laughs> yeah <laughs> A hit an area for me. That's <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I think I think he really described it well. Where it's action cameos are great. It's a fun story, but then the characters really played a big part of it, you know. And that's why I'm Sugar Bear. <laughs> well, I've got a cameo uh, comment here. We were supposed to be joined by Marie from the Two Girls One Musical Cut podcast today, but she's having dentist surgery right now. She's in a dentist. She's having right surgery now, on a dentist. That's weird. On a dentist. I know, it's weird. But she's into fashion, and I don't know how well it's going to go. Like, doing surgery on your dentist. But hey, so, but she did literally, from her waiting room, she's sending her thoughts, which I'm going to read out for you now. Oh, and she said, awesome. uh, I am sending this because uh, I don't want to give away all the spoilers. It is a spoiler podcast, Marie, it's fine. Before I get the drugs. Okay. Um, <laughs> overall, I really enjoyed this movie, and it's just a fun time. However, I did prefer it when Deadpool was low budget, like the first movie. It has a charm about it. It was missing in this one. Second, you could tell this was made during the writer's strike. It has some amazing scenes, but a script felt more like a connect the dots. And if you think about it, it doesn't make a lot of sense. Also, my favorite cameos, Hugh Jackman's abs and Henry Cavill. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Marie. I have to agree, but I think it was just such a fun Cavill's experience. Cavill's abs? The abs? Is it abs. Are you talking about Jose? No, no, just the general script, I think. Um, yes, he even said the MacGuffin thing in, in part of the, the movie. Um, but I, I think just in general, that's Deadpool. You don't expect a convoluted storyline. You just kind of it really is about just him and Vanessa and his close friends and just trying to make sure that they don't pass away. I mean, I'm going to argue later. It's not really in this one. Yeah, uh, but, uh, we'll get to it. So I really enjoyed it. Look, it's and I, as we all said, it's the most fun I've had at a fully packed out cinema in ages. I mean, it came out in the UK. We got it a day fucking early in the UK on a Thursday night. And I think I went to like a eight o'clock showing and it was rammed like half an hour beforehand. It was not space. And I haven't seen that at the cinema since probably No Way Home. That's how long ago we haven't had a sellout over here, which is great. And uh, despite it being the summer holidays, there were no small, annoying children there, which was brilliant. No one talking, no one checking their phones. It was just pure entertainment. And exactly like you say, David, it's what a screening of a film should be. And I really appreciate that, although there were tons of cameos, they're all in service to the film. And that the film really wasn't concerned with trying to fix all the MCU post Endgame issues, which, like uh, Stu said, Kevin Feige hinted strongly at that's what we were going to get. It's its own thing, though, but I think the film works so well because it's its own thing and it wasn't trying to connect the dots to all the other franchises. So uh, we've talked a little bit about cameos. Here is your list of cameos from the film. Uh, what I'm going to do, I'm going to quickly run through them as fast as I can, and then you're going to tell me your favourite cameo and why. So first up, we've got John Favreau coming back as Happy Hogan, turning down Deadpool for the Avengers. Technically, in the TVA, you have Hemsworth's four, as we see a future on one of the monitors where Thor is crying over Deadpool's body. Why is Thor crying? Although that footage is from Thor The Dark World, I believe, and I've just superimposed him over that. Incorrect. They actually re refilmed it because I saw him on the red carpet and they talked about him filming that. Well, well they moment. messaged me with you because apparently Hemsworth said he did. He, well, I saw an interview with Hemsworth where he said he didn't even know he was in the film. <laughs> oh, damn it. Then I, well, I, feel, I, was, I feel like they might be messing with you there. I, they were messing with me. Ryan Reynolds says on a red carpet, man, take with a grain of salt, man. The man yeah. is a liar. He is a liar. Son of a gun. They got me. We get the back of the Hulk's head when Deadpool is multiverse hopping. Now, apparently, that's a reference to Wolverine's first ever comic book appearance when he fights the Hulk. It's that same frame they put. Uh, making the internet lose its collective mind was seeing a Henry Cavill Wolverine, again, with the universe hopping. I think, though, that's just like Krasinski in Multiverse of the Madness. I think it's like it's a one-and-done joke. Uh, still, he did look the part and cue ramp in speculation. Honestly, you owe DC nothing, Henry. Nothing. Uh, <laughs> in The Void, once we meet Cassandra and Ovis Minions, we have Tyler Mayne coming back as Sabretooth. The Minions were in it? I missed that completely. <laughs> <laughs> what? Oh, good. I just got <laughs> It's been a long day, and I am in a pool of sweat. Most of the <laughs> Yeah, so Tyler Mayne, Sabretooth, comes back from the original X-Men from 24 years ago. Aaron Stanford's Pyro's back from X2. And uh, we get variants played by different actors. Because I was like, oh, wait a minute. Is that... Oh, it's not. Because there was all these actors, there's all these characters you recognise from the other X-Men Fox films, but it wasn't the same actors playing them. So you had like characters like uh, Toad, Lady Deathstrike, Callisto, Arclight, Azrael, Juggernaut, Cyclops, Bullseye, and even the Russian from 2004's Lionsgate, The Punisher. 
Chris Evans faked out the whole MCU and even Deadpool himself because we got the Avengers theme, we got the build, we wait for the Avengers symbol, and then we got Flame on. So yeah, Evans' first iconic book role, Johnny Storm. Daphne Keane returns as a now adult X-23, although she's still only 19. So it's bizarre that she's still only 19, but was 11. I think she was 11 when she made uh, Logan, which is crazy. And even though it's not her Logan, they still share a nice scene. Uh, we have to talk about the Void's forgotten heroes, starting with Jennifer Garner's Electra, who gets a nice jab about Ben Affleck as her, her dead devil died off screen. And she's like, yeah, bothered. Uh, <laughs> Channing Tatum turns up as Gambit, another film that was planned yes. as a spin-off for him that had never happened. And uh, Tatum's overly fit Cajun accent is hilarious because Wade can't understand him and neither can we. And uh, the biggest <laughs> surprise for me probably was only motherfucking Wesley Snipes turning up as Blade. Arguably the first Marvel movie success, even though it was through New Line. And I love that he says, there's only one Blade, there's only going to be one Blade. And that definitely doesn't bode well for Marvel's troubled reboot with Mashala Ali. Did they just announce it wasn't happening in this film? It's literally what I was thinking when they did that. Uh, that'd be a great way to do it. Like, you know, you could just imagine the rest of them sitting there. Wait, is, is our film not happening now? Anyway, Kumi <laughs> Masaki from uh, Loki turns up, uh, Hunter B-15. She turns up at the end, near the end. You've got the female variant of Deadpool, uh, played by Blake Lively, uh, Ryan Reynolds' wife, obviously, although we never see her face. And also in the massive Deadpool scene, we have Matthew McConaughey as Cowboy Deadpool, Nathan what? Fillion... And Nathan Fillion as Headpool. And uh, when you see the one with the Welsh flag on him, this is it actually made me laugh. So everyone's like, oh, who's that going to be? Is that going to be Rob McElhenney? Yeah, apparently his cameo was cut or he's one of the guards you see for like a split second in a TVA near the start. Yeah. But um, the guy with the Welsh Deadpool thing on is Paul Mullen. So everyone's like, yeah, we got Welsh. Paul Mullen's from Liverpool, so he's English. <laughs> so he's not actually Welsh Paul. So although he's quote unquote quite Mark's Welsh Paul, you got an English guy playing him, not actually one of the Welsh players, which would have made a bit more sense. So, uh, hey, but hey, you're splitting. As hairs. an American, that makes no, no, no difference to me. True, <laughs> it doesn't. Um, but also, the 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 funny thing is that he's like he's a player from obviously from Ryan Reynolds uh, and Rob McElhenney's football team, Wrexham. Wrexham Probably United. have to explain that. Yes. <clears throat> yeah. So um, what Neil got it's way too excited uh, about this then was <laughs> football, football, football in a movie. Oh my god, a footballer! Uh, which is exactly what he just said. But uh, but yeah, like so that uh, Paul Mullen is a is a Wrexham United footballer. He's not in fact an actor. But the the thing that Neil is saying is he's not one of the Welsh players on that team, even though he's wearing a Welsh flag on his Deadpool outfit. He's actually did from I, Liverpool. Did I not make it clear then, Ben? Is, what you say, is that what you're saying? I mean, it's what you were saying that was, uh, that was, <laughs> <laughs> that was the problem. The star of the, she's the star of the, the, the team, isn't he? Gotcha. He's the striker. He's top scorer. Of the he's league. Ryan Reynolds' his best mate. Yeah. Oh, wow. Anyway, Man. so uh, cameos, gentlemen. Uh, Stu, favourite cameo? I, I had no expectation whatsoever to ever see uh, Channing Tatum as Gambit, so I was very <laughs> surprised by that one. And I knew uh, my wife turned to me in the theater and she was like, "Is that Magic Mike?" And I was like, "Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll explain I'll this one to, to you when the movie's over." What's Magic Mike? <laughs> yeah, they should have done it. it. Should have been a Magic Mike reference in there. Oh wow. Yeah. I wish, and as opposed to Ben, who didn't see any of the trailers, I did see the trailers, and I wish the trailers hadn't spoiled Daphne Keene being in it, because the third trailer did show her, and I wish I had not known she was going to be in it. That would have been nice. I'm lucky I missed that. I, I, I heard there was a spoiler in the last trailer, and so I just avoided it. I okay. Just stayed offline for the last three days. I like posted something, didn't look, and then went back the next day. So, uh, uh, Ben, favorite cameo? Oh, this is really hard, isn't it? Like I can't. There's no, there's no one cameo that didn't make me like that. Made that, that there was sorry. There's no cameo that made me more excited than the next. Like there was the barrage of like like Jennifer Garner, um, like Channing Tatum, and then like Wesley Snipes. That th- that three for one was like, oh my god, it's Electra. Cool. Uh, like oh look, he's <laughs> oh look, he's playing Gambit. That's fucking brilliant. And then like Snipes comes in, and you're like, no way. <laughs> like I mean, that was that was truly truly awesome. But like like I mean, I think every single one of them was really clever. I think that there was like the misdirector of Chris Evans was fucking excellent, and like the the end of credit scene with him, like. <laughs> he, he should get. He's probably going to get my favorite cameo just for that end of credit scene and how they weaved it in and how fucking hilarious it was. 
So I'm going to say that, but I think they're all as good as each other because it was great seeing Daphne Keane, like, you know, and having like her set up for those, those like really heartfelt moments because they do play on that Logan like relationship mm-hmm. quite heavily, which is really clever. Um, especially as the second movie starts with fuck Wolverine, you know? So like they're like, it, it's t- typical Deadpool. But yeah, I would say uh, if I have to like gun to head, uh, I would say it was Christopher Evans as Johnny Storm and mainly because of the after credit scene. Nice. Jose. I was going to say it's a, it's a close run for me because Gambit is someone who I've been waiting a long time to see. And as much as I love Channing Tatum overdoing that Cajun accent. And I honestly, I think they did a really good, a thing with him with the cards and it's a good proof of concept that gambit can become a really good character to play in, in live action but i'm i gonna agree chris evans uh america's ass playing johnny storm <laughs> i think that was such a great uh opportunity that they even showed him fly a little bit before he got all the flames sucked out of him and just cursing up a storm and getting his skin ripped off that was that was <laughs> that was just so great i didn't expect to even see him that long you know, so I th- I'm a fan of Chris Evans. So to see him play Johnny Storm was great. Yeah, I I, I was I'm, I'm I was torn between Blade because he was the most unexpected for me. I was like, and bearing in mind that him and Ryan Reynolds when they worked together on Blade Trinity didn't get on at all. I was I was reading some of the stuff uh, oh. in in research for this and like apparently like hadn't spoke they hadn't spoken about twenty years and then like Ryan Reynolds just called him up and was hey do you want to be in the new thing and he's like you know looked at it, he was like yeah okay. <laughs> and then just, and he, I, I think he basically sort of said, you know, people have said Wesley Snipes is a very quiet guy on set. He's like very reserved and that. And he's, you know, I just think the way I don't think Ryan Reynolds is acting like Ryan Reynolds is that's how he is. <laughs> so they, they just didn't get gel very well. So uh, the fact that he came back for it, I know, uh, just absolutely got to. But no, I'm, I'm afraid that I still have to go with John. I have to go with Chris Evans as well. Because, yeah, like you say, <laughs> the fake out is brilliant. And he gets the most. His very non PG thirteen rant at the end, which was just superb, and the fact it's all caught on camera because the whole way through you're just waiting for Deadpool. Of course, Deadpool said that. Of course, he is. And then you get there, <laughs> yeah. there's, no, there's no way he's making this up. And then you see it at the end, you're like, "Holy shit!" No, he did actually say it all, and he gets the best and most horrific death in the whole film. <laughs> he was taking up too much of the budget. Yeah? <laughs> into a pile of bones and blood. David, what is your favorite cameo? <laughs> Uh, my favourite cameo, like the rest of you, was Chris Evans. I fell for the misdirection, hook, line and sinker. Uh, the, the second he went flame on, everyone in the freaking audience was like, ah! <laughs> <laughs> it was just one of the peak They turned into chickens. Of- <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, yeah, that was that was it for me. It was uh, the, the most unexpected one was obviously Wesley yeah. Snipes. But yeah, Chris Evans, the flame on moment. Oh, the, it was just peak cinema moment. <laughs> beautiful, beautiful, man. Right. And now moving on to the soundtrack. So the music of Deadpool was massively on point. And here's a little rundown of some of the key songs. I'm not going to go through all of them because there's way too many. But I think the ones that were key to the film here. So uh, we have Bye 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 for the intro sequence performed by NSYNC. And it's not Ryan Reynolds in the suit, surprisingly. Ben, who is it? Uh, it's a guy called Nicholas Pauly and they call him Dance Paul. Cool. Cool, Paul. <laughs> not, not Justin Timberlake because I really thought it was going to be him. No, he's... Persona non grata at the minute, I believe. Uh, yeah, he's he's falling from grace as we speak. He just wants to be a bad boy, doesn't he? He'll literally be doing dick in a box for real soon. What's what's? Oh, damn! That that just went way harder than I was going to say. This is going to ruin the world tour. Uh, next up, we had Angel of the Morning, which obviously is a redux from the uh, first Deadpool film. We had Irish performed by the Goo Goo Dolls, the song that I heard every bloody week for about seven years on karaoke nights on ships. It is the most beloved song in the Philippines for some reason. And you would hear the song sung six or seven times every night. I mean, if that's not enough to drive... It's a rendition. No, I would never... Even, <laughs> I even had a twitch in the film when I heard that song because... And I like, don't no. want the world to know me because I don't think that they'd understand. Oh, Neil's just killed himself. <laughs> I, would have, I was going to join in. Damn it, he stopped. <laughs> Next up, though, we have oh, one of the greatest movie songs of all time. Probably the greatest movie song of all time. Uh-oh. The Power of Love from Back to the Future for the, uh, the time travel montage. That was, was so good. Yeah. That was such so a good, good moment. Yeah. Uh, we got Lady in Red by Chris DeBerg. We got a bit of Avril Lavigne with I'm With You. You've got The Greatest Show from The Greatest Showman soundtrack, which having not seen the film, I didn't get the reference. So uh, I was like, <laughs> okay, I probably would have laughed at that if I'd known it. But also I didn't want to subject myself to that film. So uh, uh, Punk Rock Factory do a version of it if you want to have a listen. 
I will see that when I see them in October. Nice. There you go. Oh. Uh, okay. Also, one of the highlights has to be You're the One That I Want from Greece, oh, only so as the two of them are just stabbing the shit out of each other for about a full day in the car. That was that moment for me in the cinema was really weird because my buddy Chris, who I went to see it with, he pulled up in his car when he turned up at my place to park. And Greece, like, Greece was on the fucking radio. He was, oh, he wow. was, and he was like singing it down the road. I was like, you, "What's going on?" He went, "Oh, it's the last song on the radio that I heard when I got out of the car." And then, like that, it, we went straight from his car to the cinema. And then, I, like he, it, it came on. He just fucking looked at me like, <laughs> like "Am I some kind of psychic? I've, like, I've summoned it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I've released, the, released the musical kraken." Did you make sure you didn't have any like sharp knives as you got back in the car? Baby knife. Baby knife. <laughs> <laughs> we had I'll Be Seeing You by Jimmy Durant we had Make Me Lose Control performed by Eric Carmen, and I misread that as Eric Cartman I was like wait <laughs> <laughs> that's just my terrible eyesight as Ben wanted to call me for the podcast Blind Neil hmm. uh, oh. and of course we have Good Riddance Time of Your Life by Green Day uh, one of the greatest songs of all time again for the surprisingly touching Fox Marvel uh, the Fox Universe Marvel films mm. which we've had for the last 24 years and uh, mysteriously, not on the soundtrack list that I saw, but definitely in the film, because it was all over the fucking trailer, was Madonna's Like a Prayer. And uh, obviously in one of the film's best scenes. I'm guessing it was like licensing snafus maybe prevented it. And the same with ACDC's Hell, Hell's Bells for the first Deadpool and Wolverine fight. So, gentlemen, I want your favourite needle drop from the film. Stu. Uh, I think it has to be Bye Bye Bye. Just that whole scene with the dancing and the killing the TVA agents. That was the part of the movie I referenced earlier where I said my wife was laughing so hard she was crying. That was the part of the movie where she was just tears coming down her face, laughing hysterically at that. That was great. She has since watched TikTok showing the dance moves matched up against the actual Bye 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 video, and it's apparently like spot for spot. So you can't beat that. And I also, to throw out a second one, I really like the the Green Day song at the end with the all the scenes and all the clips and all the backstage antics from the previous Fox Universe movies. I thought that was really touching and a, a nice little love letter to those films. So for me, it's definitely those two. Nice. Ben? Uh, definitely Iris because it makes it irks you so much. Um, but honestly, that when that song came on, they walked around the, walked around the corner, and it was. All, I was just like, "This is fucking perfect." Like you couldn't have chosen like a, a like a cheesier but more power ballady song to to sum that little moment up. And uh, and yeah, and I'm. I think it I, it legitimized the song again for me. I put it on when I got home. I was like, "This is a great song." I don't care what Neil thinks. Good God, man! That's it's, 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 it's going to be Creed's time next year, isn't it? Again. <laughs> well, I mean, yeah, they're getting back together, aren't they? And doing, doing that tour. So, that's Sweet the whole thing. Jesus, I didn't want to know that, David. <laughs> <laughs> Just to be a little, a little different. My favourite bit was actually the Greatest Showman because when that <laughs> yes, came on at the radio, it was the first song that came on the radio during the car fight scene, <laughs> yeah. and it was for like, um, like two seconds, and I was like, oh, I love this song, and I got well excited, <laughs> and then it immediately swaps because they go, they, it goes through about three or four songs until it sticks with a. Uh, into the sticks of Greece, that for just that like brief moment, I got very excited. So I'm going to go with the greatest showman. Okay, Jose. Yeah, I'm going to go with Stu and say "Good Riddance" at the end of the movie. I think it was uh, just that song in particular. I I just enjoy so much. I'm not a music guy, so I enjoyed the other songs, but that one just hit a little harder, especially with the clips. I think that was just a nice touch. It was touching. Yeah. I mean, yeah, I, I I love the use of time of your life for that. Is like I say, it was strangely affecting watching these films that generally aren't regarded as all that great. And they, there was even a few shots I noticed of Josh Trank's Fantastic Four in there. Mm. And I yeah. was like, yeah. Yeah. They, yeah. they included yeah, every there. single every single Fox property because yeah. it was almost like yeah, it was almost as you know, like like without these movies, we don't have the ones that we have now. And it was like, you know, a lot of people work really hard on those movies and whether you love or hate them, like that, you know, there's effort gone in there and there's like, you know, you should definitely- Maximum like, effort. Maximum effort gone in there. And you should definitely like, you know, give those people the credit they deserve. Um, so yeah, I think that, that I think that, that was a really lovely moment, but it's still not Goo Goo Dolls, is it now? Having said that, for me, yeah, it's definitely going to be Irish. No, it's not. <laughs> yeah, no that bait and switch yeah. would be amazing if you did that. Yeah, that, that was a whole setup, mate. No, it wasn't. No, it has to be- Power of Love from Back to the Future, man. I mean, come on. Uh, and if that was true, if they tried that in any other film, I would have probably been like getting a bonfire ready to burn someone and like yelling <laughs> sacrilege, like running through the town center, getting an angry mob together. 
But no, they fucking nailed it with this man, didn't they? Of course you're going to use that song for this man. And they just did it so well. And so much so, you're almost missing the song because you're like, who's the next cameo going to be? Who's the next cameo? Why is there a tiny Wolverine? (laughs) <laughs> you know, I mean, again, it was comic movie. accurate Wolverine because he's really comic small in accurate. the comics. People like people don't see that because the cartoon like gave him about two foot, made him about two foot taller. Like, but like the the comics, he's like he's small. Jackman like, made him about four foot taller. Yeah. 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 So next, gentlemen, uh, I thought I'd uh, give a little shout out to our guest Stu here, and what we're going to do is. We're going to liberally borrow, some would say outright steal, from the Stew World Order. And what I wanted to do is I want each of you to... T- I'll allow it. <laughs> I'm glad you said yes, because we would have been in the shit otherwise. <laughs> and what I want to do is I want each of you to tell me your favourite scene in the movie, but also one thing you didn't like in the movie. Ben, I'm looking at you, and you can't say the thing I didn't like about the film was that it ended. Otherwise, you'd be on an eternal loop <laughs> rewatching it, and we'd have to get the TV TVA involved again. Amazing. So just fuck my freedom of speech, right? Exactly. Cool. You get pruned, so that's what's happening. <laughs> so, obviously, first to our guest, Stu. It's your format. What was your favorite part of the film? I think my favorite part of the film was the uh, the fight against all the Deadpool's with the uh, like a prayer playing, and it was just uh, it was interesting just seeing them tear through. I think you got some solid one cut shots of them like panning down the street, and you see Jackman and and Ryan Reynolds just fighting all of these other Deadpool's, and just incredibly brutal fight scenes, clawing people in the dicks, shooting people in the face, hacking people up. I thought it was an incredibly effective fight scene for that, and it was the best fight cinematography in the movie. So I had. A lot of fun with that, especially, like I said, with Like a Prayer playing, because it's such an odd music choice, but they that's what they do in these movies. They pick odd music choices that shouldn't fit, but they make them work anyway. So I think that was my favorite scene overall. That's what stuck with me. And I think you hinted this early on. The one thing you didn't really like about the film. Yeah, the one thing I didn't like is that it doesn't end with Deadpool in the 616. It doesn't end with Logan in the 616. It doesn't really... It's just a little self-contained movie. It feels like going forward in the MCU, you could have watched Deadpool and Wolverine or you could have missed it. And either way, it's going to be the same. But I distinctly read something where Feige came out and said, like, if you're looking on a scale of importance, this movie's an eight. If Infinity War was a nine and Endgame was a 10, Deadpool and Wolverine was an eight. And that's bullshit, Feige. Nothing in this movie is (laughs) important. I'm glad I don't have to follow that. Ben. Favorite uh, part of the film, God, and you can't say the whole film. That's not fair. All right, so um, the moment that like that caught me like by surprise was right at the start where he's having that fight with the TVA agents, and he's like, and he's he does the whole like I'm not using my I'm not using my katanas, and he just uses Wolverine's like metal bones. And then he puts on the claws and jabs one guy in the balls and one guy in the ass and he gets stuck and he can't pull <laughs> his claws out of either one. I was in fucking pieces. I was like, it's like, it's like the, it's like the most ridiculous toilet humor, but like, but done with such like, such like a plum. It was just so well thought out. And like, it was like that for me was probably the best, like the, the, the scene that uh, I enjoyed the most. Uh, just in general, but like there were so many moments you can't really pick, but I'm going to say that one just because it's funny as fuck. And Ben, I know it's going to be hard. I know this is going to shatter your soul, but what is one thing you didn't like about the film? Dog pulls tongue in Ryan Reynolds' mouth. Oh, <laughs> yeah. That's bad. It just made me, it just it. made me clam up and go, ah, oh, dude, you're letting that dog lick in up. All right. Fair enough. I mean, at least that's the only place his tongue went. Well, do we know that? On film. Director's cut. Camera. <laughs> release the dog pool cut. No, don't release the dog pool cut. No. <laughs> Never release the dog pool cut. Uh, David, your favourite scene, pro, biggest pro of the film. You talked about dog pool. Dog pool was one of my favourite things. It was my favourite moment. It was just before the fight with the other Deadpools. And you've just blown off good pool's head. And you've got <laughs> Wolverine just casually walking across the street holding dog pool. And just that... I fucking creasing i was laughing my head off at that moment i thought it was so funny i think i was the only person in the cinema that found it as funny as what it was. <laughs> <laughs> because i was there laughing just a little too loud <laughs> it was and my wife's there just whacking me be like stop 
because because I was laughing too much. Oh, yeah. Um, so yeah, I'm going to go with that just because <laughs> it's a it's a funny moment. And then um, my con was not really from the film itself, but it was more just all the the amount of marketing that went into it in the build up. And like you alluded to at the beginning, uh, that third trailer had spoilers in it that I felt like just didn't need to be in there. The, the film markets itself with having Deadpool and Wolverine in it. That's really like all you need to do. Just one trailer or two trailers. But there was so much marketing that went on to it. And it was almost a little bit too much. So I that was probably my con. Okay. Although I've seen a lot of the uh, the chemistry between Hugh Jackman and Ryan Reynolds in like all of the different stuff was quite fun. Like in Hot, hot Ones and yeah. stuff. Yeah. That's oh, great. Nice, man. Yeah. Jose, favorite scene? It's, it's, I think I'm going to go against the grain here a little bit, and the the fight with Deadpool and Wolverine by themselves uh, when they first Which get uh, into the void with the uh, 20th Century Fox sign in the with background. 20th Century Fox, I think it was just really fun. It's you see them. There's no like cuts away from outside of the vehicle. It just straight on damage, 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 and lots of fun choreography. Um, I mean, to be honest, like the whole film was a solid yes, you know. And that was just, I, 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 that's me just picking something that kind of peaks a little bit more. Oh, so um, it's fine for Jose to say the whole film's great, but I was fucking banned from it. Well, I I'm see. not the one that I <laughs> fucking see. Right. Uh, permission to grant the podcast as hostile, Your Honor. <laughs> uh, presumed innocent. <laughs> Good call. Good call back like that. But uh, I'd say the con, and this is going to be a nitpick, really, because it's not really that negatively. Is, um, I'm going to wanted... say you're a nitpick. I wanted to see more of Wolverine Sabretooth because as cool as it was just to do one quick slice of the head, I mean, they put it in the freaking trailer and then they just last two seconds. And I'm like, he could have had a little bit more of a struggle or something, you know. That's well, a he's old now, the guy. He's an ex-pro wrestler, Tyler Main. So, like, you know, yeah. he probably but couldn't he put, do that much. Put makeup on a, a stuntman and, and <laughs> let him do all the work. I think half those people were, weren't they? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. I think I, th- I, but that's that. That that's really it. You know, it's. It, I I just wanted more of that particular fight. I think they did a great job with all the other fights. Uh, sometimes though, I'm a little uh, hesitant to enjoy large fights with multiple people because then it can be hard to choreograph something really good. But um, you know, you don't want to miss I, the action, do you? You want you want exactly. cinematography that shows you the moves yeah. clearly, so you can go, "That's awesome." Rather than, "Oh, we're hiding the budget. It's not gone that well." Let's shoot it at night yeah. and have the camera move around lots. Mm-hmm. Like I'm a big fan of the raid. That is like large Who scale Jose? fights. Who isn't? Yeah, but I mean that guy was like a seriously fucking insane martial artist before he was an actor. So like that was that was super easy. But that's like obviously peak fighting and the choreography. Oh, and I don't know. Capturing the, it. The, bit, the bit in the Deadpool Wolverine movie where he bounces the fucking katana off the ground and goes for that guy's <laughs> face. Dude, and that he's was like, funny. take my country's name out of your mouth. <laughs> <laughs> in my katana he can't pull it out <laughs> i didn't even hear the joke that he because everyone was laughing throughout the whole the, the oh, that, was a, that was a full-on will smith reference it was brilliant oh was it oh shoot you're right yeah i didn't even catch that because people were just laughing the, throughout that experience it was it was really funny to watch everything so, so uh i've kind of gone wrong with my answer here which i scripted out and just realized ooh. that um so i've kind of got a two far so for me the biggest pro of the film was that after so many Marvel films that were just fine and how the pressure was really on for this to be a box office hit and a critical hit, it was. Like, yes, critical response is a bit mixed in places. Like, it's the run... I've seen the whole gummit from five-star reviews to one-star reviews in the British press. It's insane that there's, like... No one's saying it's just fine. Like, everyone's... It's it's a travesty. It's the worst thing ever in the history of film. To other people going, no, it's fucking brilliant. Exactly what we wanted. But online chatter shows you this film has been a massive hit. And the reason is, as the kids say, this film slaps. It's two hours of pure entertainment. It's got the. I don't. You said about problem with the pace. I didn't think the pace slowed at all the whole film. I was dialed in. I didn't get bored. You know, I wasn't even bored. Not bored. The word, but I was just like fully in from the opening credits. Man, I was there. And I haven't, like uh, David was saying, I haven't had that experience in the cinema since Endgame, where the whole crowd just gets the film on every level. Uh, you know, the crowd were whooping, they were gasping, the constant laughter. Just seeing the whole audience on the same page as the filmmakers knows you know they've done such a great job. And I think recently the MCU has got so caught up in world building and trying to connect the dots between their properties, they just forgot to make entertaining films around those pop lines along the way. But if I had to say a scene, I was thinking about it, and it's a Deadpool Wolverine, it's a car fight, so you're the one that I want. Just because that song choice makes that scene for me. And the fact you're like, it's one of those kind of joke action scenes where... Okay, they're just going to have a little fight. No, it's going on. It keeps going on. 
day and night passes, it's still <laughs> fucking going on, you know. So it just cuts them both laying there, and that's when like X twenty three just turns up. It's like, oh great. Just but it's, it's, no, they're both lying there, but Deadpool's wrapped up in all the seatbelts. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, that's the thing. That's why? Like, I want to know why that because he's like because he fucking lost. <laughs> like, and that's and that's the important part of that because like there's loads of there's loads of like Deadpool comics where like they do a crossover with Spider Man and Deadpool gets his ass kicked by Spider Man but he just keep he he keeps coming back he, and like there's a there's a cross there's a um the, the crossover one with um Spider Man there's a point where Deadpool somewhere like gets caught up in like a a, a a sheet and he's wearing it like a cape and the the panel goes to like a silhouette and like he's in a monologue he's going don't do it don't fucking do it don't do it man and he's just stood there and he goes. I'm Batman. So like there's all of these fucking amazing references and shit like that is like, is a callback to the comics where like, like Deadpool would get his ass handed to him by Wolverine over and over again. And if he wasn't convinced that he could beat him, he was convinced they were best mates. And that's what kind of like, that's what I loved about this. My con is again, it's a very minor one and it's, um, it's basically Stu's one as well, where I thought this was going to be the film that would reset the MCU and like prune off all the branches of the post credit scenes that appear to go nowhere. Eternals, I'm looking at you. Fuck <laughs> off, Harry Styles. Fuck off. And uh, the Marvel, <laughs> but actually, the Marvel stuff I think is going to happen. The Marvel stuff I think is going somewhere. But to its credit, Deadpool and Wolverine was mostly a standalone film, and I actually think, looking back on it, that was the right decision. I, I listened to an interview with uh, director Sean Levy the other morning, and he said he just wanted it to be its own thing, and it really is. So I guess that means next summer now, Matt Shackman's Fantastic Four that is going to be the film that starts bringing it all together for the next phase. Unless there's like something in Deadpool and Wolverine that they call back to, to legitimize the Fantastic Four's entrance to the MCU. Because I think it seems like that, um, that Fantastic Four movie is going to be a period film. So like there, maybe there's something there. Um, I think, I, I think that, if if this movie does go unnoticed by the MCU, like and it just get, like that's no bad thing. But if there is something in there that we've all sort of like let it slip by, and all of a sudden they call back to it and go, "Oh, you didn't see that fucking glaring, incredible thing that ties everything that's together." Right, yeah, yeah. That would be great. But I did see an interview with um, Sean Levy from um, Comic Con, like San Diego Comic Con, just happened, where he said that him and Kevin Feige have differences of opinions as to where this movie actually sits in um, in the phase phases oh, okay. of the MCU. Mm. Feige is saying it's definitely the current phase, which is where are we now? Phase four hundred and six. <laughs> like he says, phase Feige three, says it's yeah. very much in that phase, and Sean Levy is saying it's not. It's just it's like an outlier. So even those two can't like. It's like the Batman, the Batman, oh, the, Batman. the Batman, the Batman. What are they going to call the second one? The the Batman's the the Batman the Bateman. Some Batman. <laughs> Son of Batman. Right, so uh, moving on. Well, according to Box Office Mojo, the top film of the year and still going strong at the minute is Inside Out 2 with 1.4 billion at the time of wow. recording. And that is almost double the second place film on the list this year, which is June Part 2 with 711 million at the time of recording. That came out this year? I was just thinking the, the same t- thing. <laughs> Fucking hell. <laughs> oh my yeah. God. But. At the time of recording today, Deadpool and Wolverine has taken 438 million worldwide in four days. It's got the biggest R rating debut of all time and the eighth biggest opening of any film of all time. Wow. So, my question is, gentlemen, will this be the biggest film of the year? Stu. I don't see it passing Inside Out 2. I mean, if it did, it would be a miracle. An R-rated movie that's this big passing a kid's movie that's as big as Inside Out 2 is. But, um... It'll pass Dune 2, obviously. It'll probably be the second biggest movie of the year, which, like I said, is astounding for an R-rated movie in this day and age. But uh, yeah, Inside Out 2 is just a, a kid's movie juggernaut. I, I don't see it surpassing that. And it's the summer holidays as well. I've just started. So you've got another month of it playing every day. So yeah. it's definitely going to ramp up, I reckon, yeah. I reckon Inside Out 2 could probably get close to around $2 billion by the end of this. Which is insane. Who Who saw that coming? I loved Inside Out, but I didn't see the sequel doing as well as it is. It's it's yeah, I thought, absolutely. Yeah. I thought it was going to get, I thought it was going to get slapped in the ass by Minions Four. That yeah, that feels like the the property to me that was going to be the was going to be the big like kids movie because you know, I, I I think those movies are excellent. But yeah, I mean, there's no, I don't think there's any way that um that anything catches up with that now because I mean, not it's just it's it's simple mathematics, isn't it? I mean, like I went, I don't have to take like my parents to go and see this movie 
Like any kid that wants to go to see Inside Out, they're instantly scoring two tickets straight away. So yeah. like, you know, like that's it, that's why it's got as many fucking people seeing it because there's a bunch of people in there that don't want to see the movie, but their kids really fucking do. So they're bad parents. Everyone should go and see Inside Out too, man. It's a cracking movie as well. Is it? I yeah. like the first one. I thought the first one was great. I haven't seen the second one. one's album. really good as well, man. And uh, yeah, it's... Uh, Do we know what Twisters is doing right now? Because that came out that last much. week. Not that much. Outside. It's done well. It's done very, very well. It had a but, um, strong yeah. opening, but I think I knew Deadpool was going to take away a lot of its wind. Yeah, it's... Alien Alien Alien. Alien. That was good. <laughs> he doesn't even know what he said. <clears throat> he doesn't know what he what did. What do they do? <laughs> take away its wind? It was good. Wind? Twisters? Take it. Come on, Ozzy. Twisters. Oh! Alternated. Christ. Hell, that man. was a good 30 seconds. <laughs> oh, wow. Sorry, I'm looking, at the, the film. I'm looking at the next few movies that are sh- sh- should come out. Alien Romulus probably do well, but not Jose, great. Jose, none of these are going to come close. I can't see anything else coming Beetle out this Juice, year. Beetlejuice, Star 11. Beetlejuice could do well, actually. Beetle Joker? Juice. That, no, that's not going to do. That that's not rated. That'll, that'll be all right, but it won't do as well. So, Ben, you are same as you, right? Inside Out two. Uh, yeah, I think Inside Out series the biggest. I think I think Deadpool's going to be second biggest of the year, uh, and I think there's definitely something that's going to creep up that, that looks like it might take its mantle. I mean, like Joker's going to be going to do great, and I think Beetlejuice is going to do great. Uh, maybe Gladiator uh, is that out oh, this year? Gladiator, Gladiator, yeah. Gladiator it could be a, it could be a, a, like that. Maybe Gladiator is the one that's going to like rival it. But other than that, I can't see anything else touching it. Speaking of touching things, David. <laughs> uh, I I just echo what everybody else has said. I was surprised Inside Out had made as much money as it had. If I'm honest, but I think it'll run it close. Uh, but I think there'll probably be about like 400 million in it. At just, the end. just the old yeah. 400 million, yeah. Well, just the old 400 million. <laughs> what is that? And Jose? Uh, honestly, yes. I think this is going to be the biggest film. The only other thing I saw that well, has any potential. You think Deadpool's going to be Inside Out? Yes. I think it's going to oh, be wow. close. Honestly, I think it's going to be close. What do you mean? Is it going to beat it? Is Deadpool yes. going to make more money? Than I think it's just going to slowly make more money over time because uh, granted, there are parents who want to take kids to see this movie, but I think Deadpool, you know, ah, shit. Are you a politician? Because I, I don't know. I think, I think it either does it. I'm going <laughs> to just say yes. I'm going to go say I think it's going to beat it. It's going to not do it right away, but I think over time it's going gonna, it's gonna to beat it. Oh, I hope so. Ooh. That'd be great. I mean, there are lots of children who probably – Inside Out Age, who want to go and see the latest Marvel film, and they're like, "No, you can't go see it." So they're going to go minion style on top of each other's shoulders with a big jacket. Yes, and they're all going to <laughs> they'll still only pay for one ticket. With one ticket. Yes, I know, I know, Ben. You're all talking about R-rated films, but in America, R-rated seventeen, yes, isn't it? Correct. Yeah, yeah. So I was thinking, like over here, loads of fucking fifteen-year-olds are going to go and see that film. Oh, the cinema staff are just like America. we having to ID so many people. Yeah, they were, yeah. They were definitely IDing everybody that went to my cinema to see it. Oh, really? No, not no, not a single person. That was dripping with sarcasm, mate. Sorry, but, uh, <laughs> fuck you know. I don't know English people. Uh. Bear in mind, this was the weekend when our big one of our biggest cinema chains announced they were going to close twenty five a quarter of all their cinemas in the UK the That's weekend of the biggest film coming out. Oh uh, yeah, and then I think they were supposed to make the announcement of which ones were closing on Saturday, and they didn't. And then it came out on Sunday. Oh no, we're only closing six. So I wonder if like public reaction just kind of like you mother, you know, you motherfuckers. <laughs> wow. But yeah, luckily our ones are, are, are safer now because they are newer and uh, yeah, we're good. Right. Uh, yeah, I, I agree as well. I think it's, I don't actually I don't agree with you, Jose. I think you're wrong. I, but Inside <laughs> Out Two is going to be the number one film of the year at the box office. Uh, I think Ben's kind of right. I think Gladiator Two might catch up to Deadpool Two, but I think Gladiator Two is probably going to be. Oh, do you reckon it's going to be PG thirteen or an R? Depends how violent oh, the uh, what Gladiator. VR. Yeah. Yeah, what R, what was it? the first one? I can't remember. I think it was uh, a PG. I'm pretty sure that was R because there's heads being chopped off. Are you not entertained? You can you can cut you can cut bits and pieces off of people, and it can still be a PG. It's just how much blood you show. I think there's a def there's a different oh. definition there because Star Wars is a U, and they cut a, an alien's arm off. That's true. And, and but been, no, that it was revised to a PG in later years, wasn't it? Because it's got blood hanging out the coming yeah. out the bottom of it, which wouldn't have a fucking blood. lightsaber. With a red blood. Shut, anyway, shut your face, space law. Shut Sorry, up, Ben Carry Lord. On. Anyway, Whoa. right. So, gentlemen, we're now at the portion of the podcast where basically just talk about what you liked in it. Um, I got a few other little points I want to. This is just random musings. This section. So, one thing I I come up, I realized that I thought the main Deadpool one and two cast, so your characters like Depinda and Vanessa, they got really very little to do in it other than turn up for the birthday party scene. Mm. And I was kind of like, well, why do you need the whole Vanessa storyline thing when it's been explored so well in the first two? I, yeah. I don't think that bit kind of held together as well that, oh, wait, Deadpool just becomes a loser because he can get into the Avengers. 
Yeah. I didn't kind of bite on that bit as much. Yeah, I didn't love that. I it, it felt so weirdly forced in this movie that they separate them just to get them back together at the end. It felt yeah. like, oh, it felt like the Scream movies. Every single Scream movie, if you watch the Scream franchise, they have Dewey and Gale separated at the beginning and then they put them together and then the next movie they're separated again and it puts them back together and it just felt like why are these two characters broken up it makes no sense it was a weak aspect of the movie and after you just did Deadpool 2 where Vanessa's gone for the entire movie I really wanted to see more of Vanessa and Deadpool after Deadpool 2 and we didn't get that I'm glad that you didn't insult my favorite films there Stu screams i would never <laughs> yeah. i would and never they, besmear they get the screen together movies. only through trauma and that's what keeps them together is the trauma and the excitement and the rush of staying alive Stu. that's what happens fair and enough they separate after that because they lose that they don't have it it's like the end of the great the, the is it the graduate where they're in the bus at the end and they're just fucking like oh shit what are we yeah doing? Like the end of speed Sandra where Bullock. Uh, Sandra, Sandra Bullock, Sandra says Bullock. To, uh, you son to, of a uh, bitch, you took my line. Yeah, beat Jose to it. <laughs> Where Sandra Bullock says to Keanu Reeves, you know, uh, relationships based on extreme circumstances don't survive. And then he goes, oh, yeah, sorry. And then like 10 minutes later, after they have like a re-up of all the drama, he goes, oh, what about relationships like that based in trauma don't survive? She And she goes, would you have to base it on sex then? I mean, she <laughs> hey. sums up that whole like j- like genre plot line like in, in a really good way there. Well, it was like when we was talking about uh, when we did our Die Hard episode and we was like, when every Die Hard film starts, he's fallen out with his wife or one of his kids every film. He's great in an emergency, John McClane, but in between films, he's an absolute arsehole, basically. <laughs> what we come up with. <laughs> he's an awful person. Yeah. And he only one present. Who was that bear for? Which one? He had two kids. Isn't oh. there like <clears throat> where's a big bear they could share it? Isn't there like isn't there a part <laughs> of this that like that they needed to like they needed to like drive Deadpool in a slightly different way? Like this, this is what, this is where my pacing thing comes in because it's like, okay. it's like they, they go, he's having a party uh, because it's his birthday and he's stapling his hair on, which I thought was fucking hilarious. Um, like he's, he's hanging out with all his friends, but his ex is still there and he's all right with it. And then all of a sudden he's like, he's like trying to like, the, 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 he jumps into the interview for inter, quote unquote interview for the Avengers. And then he comes back out and he's not doing as well. Like it's, like that's where the pacing for me like came like come on came unstuck a little bit. I think if they'd have like played like stretched a bit of those come of those pieces out a little bit and condensed some of the like the Avengers interview thing, I think you would have had a, a bit it would have made a bit more sense to have them in the movie. But you're right. Depinder did nothing. He was normally hilarious. I really wanted to like, see Depinder actually be an assassin in this one and just like walk back <laughs> in having murdered someone. Like I think Peter's, yeah. dude, Peter's sugar bear, like it, he got like, a bit more to do. Like he was like he was like actually like a hugely important part of that uh, of that movie because of what happens at the end mm. but like i don't see why it was just him turning up i feel like maybe if all of his friends had turned up peter brought all of his friends you know colossus got nothing to do N- t- N- nigga sonic teenage warhead got nothing to do literally yeah. hurt you in it just so they could, he, he could go hi yukio hi wait yukio it. got more lines than nigga sonic teenage warhead yeah. yes yes she did and it's like wow all right like she like Negus you clearly were only hired like, for two days, weren't you? you know? Coolest name ever. Um, <laughs> <laughs> like, I don't think it hurt the movie. I just think that it goes back to what Marie said. Like, the heart of the movie was always like the like him and Vanessa. Yeah. And like in in the comics, there is a there is a storyline where Deadpool has to take on Thanos because what? Right, it's a whole thing. So oh, Thanos. Thanos's thing is like he wants control over death and death is a character in the in the comics and the character is a, is a female and Deadpool starts dating her and gets married to her so Thanos comes after Deadpool and it's a whole fucking thing in the comics it's genius it's hilarious it's like it's utterly bonkers and Deadpool ends up like beating Thanos at some points because of like how like smart he is or how chaotic he is but that, and they could have done that. They could have almost done that with uh, with um, Vanessa dying and becoming death, and then bringing her back that way. But they chose oh. not to go that way because that's something as a tough sell on a Hollywood audience. So, in my opinion, I think so. Um, so you so you lose a little bit of that because they like they've obviously he's gone back in time, brought everybody back to life, but there was no like. That like this is my this is my family. This is who I'm protecting. But they don't then come to his aid. They don't come and get his back. 
which is generally something that happens. Blind Owl had nothing in this movie apart from the fucking hilarious shit about cocaine, where he's <laughs> flat out said, Feige said, the only thing we can't, we can't do is cocaine. So they just come up with every single name every, for cocaine. Yeah. Every conversation they have is just, it's, it's brilliant. Did you see what Feige said about that? Um, apparently he goes, I don't mind you saying it as long as it's funny. And he oh, goes, right. you have to come up with some original way of doing it. And he's like, and, he goes, and they did. They come up with like the funniest way of doing it. Yeah, but annoyingly, that's in my con where of the over-marketing, because that was a fucking brilliant joke, but it's in the trailers. Yeah. Ah. It's in, like a lot of the jokes, which Ben managed to avoid, yes. which is great, <laughs> is that a lot of the really funny jokes were all in the trailers. Like like that one. Yeah, I think I think for me, the Deadpool movies in general, the story structure were always simple and, and not overcomplicated. And I, I think going into that, I, that's why I just accepted everything. Um, you know, it was just straightforward him wanting to be happy with people he cared about. I thought at one point he like might have moved on for Vanessa and like hooked up with Lady Paul. Oh, that would have been nice. That's your, that's kind of like a Loki style thing. And obviously the, like, the in joke of it being his missus as well. Mm. I thought. And then I was like, oh, no, wait, he's still after Vanessa, even though she's, like, dumped him. So Yeah. That was yeah, just... that didn't really work. Okay, that should have all been our con there, really, shouldn't it? <laughs> should have been. Um, it should have been. I forgot about that until you mentioned it. I actually can't remember how the relationship ended at the end of Deadpool 2. With well, he turned Deadpool... back time and brought her back. And then it filmed just ended. So we didn't see how it was kind of really going on. He kind of turned okay. back time and then that was it. Okay, because I was kind of confused over, like... As to why they weren't together, I, I do I need thought, to. I do yeah. need to bring up one person we haven't really talked about a lot yet, and that is Emma Corrin as Cassandra Nova. What do we think of her as an evil younger, and I'm going to say, hotter Professor X? <laughs> I just like she looks. She looks really like James McAvoy and Patrick Stewart, and yet somehow oh. she is very attractive. That's well, because they cut all her hair off. Neil, you and me look the same. We've got no hair. That's just how it is. <laughs> ben, are you saying you find me attractive? Is that, is, no, I'm saying I'm saying that I've just made you more attractive. Oh, okay, <laughs> okay, I'll go with that. Um, I think that I think she was perfectly cast. I, I, I yeah. mean, like she was. Um, am I right in saying that she was Princess Diana in uh, the, the Crown? Crown? Yeah, like mm. I mean, she's she is phenomenal in that, and she brings that same kind of like like kind of energy to this, like her whole. The whole confidence in like, I'm fucking happy in the void. Everything I need is here. I don't need to fuck around with anything else because I'm basically the queen here. And then, it, like, and, and she then quite quickly goes, right, well, I'm, I'm protecting what I've got. Like, she, like, I've always said this, the best bad guys are the ones that you empathize with. And the ones that you think like, well, they're only doing what I would do in that position if I was purple and had a massive chin or, you know, what else? <laughs> what, uh, what, what other bad guys have we had that were great? Um, but yeah, I thought she was fantastic. And they're like, and her power is great as well. Cause it's like, it's obviously comic accurate. Like she can only read people's minds because when she touches them, but then she can like put her hands inside of you and like do weird stuff. And creepy. like some, some of the lines, like, like her, her fingers are inside me, but not in a good way. Like, you know, all <laughs> like, like all the stuff like that. It just, it, it was great. She played that. I, I personally think that she played that perfectly. She did really, really well with not a lot of screen time, didn't she? She like made the most mm. out of every second she had there. Just on the Emma conference, she, she's in a show on Disney Plus called A Murder at the End of the World. And if you haven't seen that, that's really worth a shout watching because oh, wow. she's I love amazing that in that as well. Mm. Yeah. When she turns the human torch into a bag of bloody bones, you're like, oh, shit. She is not messing around. Baby knife. Baby. <laughs> <laughs> I got to a little bit about uh, Nice Paul and his uh, 80s soft rock hair. Oh, that was so and, cool. And uh, him, him tickling the fourth wall with his proposal line as well. Oh, no, he says, he says you're not the only one that can that can gently tickle the fourth wall. And then he does that soft pan and he turns to the camera and he just says, The proposal. proposal. The proposal. <laughs> it's funny because for, for me, I know that all the women and like half the men laughed at that. My, one of my friends was like, what was that about? Because yeah. like, you never seen the movie. You taken to see the proposal, one. did you? Basically. Yeah. I mean, that, that movie's all over Netflix right now. So like, I'm surprised more people don't know about it. I, I just actually kind of piggybacking off of when he got shot and he was using him as a human shield. And they're like, oh, so, so you, when, how fast does your healing factor work? And he's like, healing factor. <laughs> <laughs> but that's really clever because it sets up like he, he uses that as the example to be like, oh, not all Deadpools have a healing factor. And there's a hundred of them there. So I'm going to yeah. fucking kill them all. And then they all do. How many yeah. people, how many of you, and be honest, how many people thought he was going to kill that baby? 
Oh my god, I, I was like, oh, there's yeah. gonna be at least like one the baby at the end, line. and I was just like, oh god, he's gonna fucking, he's gonna like throw a sword at that fucking baby because I was so in the moment of like how many of you was killing, and I thought he was just gonna be a full on just like kill the baby, and go, oh god, oh what did I do, oh my god, <laughs> like, but like. But my mate, I said to my mate afterwards, and he was like, "What is wrong with you, man? There was no way he's going to kill that baby." I was like, "I was just so caught up in the moment." That was five years one non-negotiable. You can't kill a baby on screen. Yeah, yeah. I honestly thought they were going to allude to something. Like, all right, is it going to be you or is it going to be me? But that is. <laughs> oh oh yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. That was. Funny. Um, also, Kid Paul is apparently played by one of Ryan Reynolds' kids. Oh no really? Way. Oh okay. <laughs> It's just fucking. It's just nepotism. It, like, if you are, if you are orbiting like Ryan Reynolds, do you know everybody was saying that Taylor Swift was going to be in it because of uh, friendship with Blake Lively. Oh, that yeah. would apparently her her cameo comes where you know Deadpool's wearing that shirt with the cats on. That's Taylor Swift's cat. Oh, so like it doesn't like if you are even slightly in Ryan Reynolds' orbit, you are going to be in a Deadpool movie somehow. Do you know what they said? They reckon getting Taylor Swift to tweet about it increased the ticket sales amongst young girls who had no interest in seeing it. Fucking excellent. <laughs> That's her reach, apparently. She's yeah. going to be... Taylor Swift. She, she's going to be president man. one day, I'm telling you. Honestly, <laughs> I think she's going to be Dazzler. But... They've been Taylor saying Swift. that. I don't know. It'll be... Because yeah, she has that. some It'll acting chops. To see. I don't, I don't she know. She was very good in um, Amsterdam in a brief scene. If she anyone's was, in the film Amsterdam. The one where she got hit by a car? She got thrown <laughs> under a car, Jose. <laughs> she was really good in New Girl. Was oh, she on that show? She was on New Girl. Oh, when, I gotta um, go check out the episode now. When uh, Cece's getting married to the Indian guy, and uh, it, uh, Winston like uh, lets a fucking raccoon loose in the building, like it, the whole thing falls apart, and Cece's like husband to be goes, "I'm not in love with you anyway." And Taylor Swift stands up, and she's the one that he's in love with, and they run, and like she picks, okay. scoops him up, and runs off with him. It's really funny. That's actually really funny. Yeah, it's good. It's a good scene. Uh, oh, one of my other favourite lines in it, of course, is standing when he goes, you've joined the MCU at a bit of a low point. <laughs> <laughs> oh my God, yeah. <laughs> that, was that was great. But you can't, like, if you're going to start picking out on lines, like every other line in this movie is yeah, like yeah. incredibly yeah, just, incredible. Me, I just, like, like nothing was off the table, was it? For like, when he's talking, to, like, when he's, I, I mean, there's a, there was part of it for me where like the, he was breaking the fourth wall so often. I was like, oh, is this going to get too much? And then they reel it back in and they carry on. But like, like when he's talking to to Cavill and he's like, "They didn't deserve you," you know, like, like, and talking. And, and <laughs> yeah. my mate was like, "What was that about?" I was like, "Fucking Superman!" Like he was like, "Oh shit, yeah, of course." <laughs> and then wasn't there a reference to like Hugh Jackman being divorced too? Yes, yeah, there was. Yeah, that was yeah. one of my favorite ones. That's right. I remember, yeah. I was like, "Whoa, they they really got him on that one." <laughs> There's so many, man. You like, I you just don't miss. I like to say, I think first time viewing it in cinema, you miss some of it. Because oh, of laughter sure. from a previous yeah. joke, yeah. yeah, and like just stuff like I mean, there's literally stuff that every one of you has come out of today that I didn't know about the film, even though I spent all weekend researching it. Because <laughs> there's just so it? many goddamn it's so dense. Toys in it. But you know, like you know, the car scene where you're there in the fight in the car, and like it, it, it's ba- it's almost blow for blow the very first car fight scene in the first Deadpool movie because uh, oh, wow. like, Jackman smashes his head into the radio, and that's what's changing the stations, which is what happens in the first uh, first Deadpool movie. And they oh, go wow. through some of those songs are some of those songs. So like, sh- like Shoop is in there and something else. And I was like, oh, fuck, they've just, they've like gone fourth wow. wall and fourth wall. They've like broken their own fourth wall. You're up to the seventh wall at this point, man. It's up to the wow. 39th wall. Also, this brings me back to the question. Do you think Honda paid them or do you think they just happened to use a Honda Odyssey because they thought it was a shitty car? If I was Honda and I paid them to rag on my cars as hard yeah. as they fucking yeah. did, <laughs> I'd be fucking furious. But Are you kidding probably. me? My brother-in-law and a friend of ours, they're both like, we own Hondas. They got the car in the movie. And they were actually excited <laughs> to have the Honda the Odyssey because of that. But they didn't go out and buy those cars because of that. Like that's <laughs> they the will thing. now, though, Ben. They will, absolutely will not. keep buying the Honda Odyssey forever because the <laughs> Honda Odyssey fucks. <laughs> <laughs> and there is the trailer clip. There we go. There, there we go. go. Um, got to talk the Wrath of Khan homage at the end as well. Oh, God. Well, that was was that Wrath of Khan or was that oh because he does the Star oh, Trek window Star Trek yeah. bit yeah when they're both trying to decide who's going to sacrifice himself yeah but they, it almost got to Austin Power levels Austin Powers levels of joking there at that page for all the emotions were right on the edge but he kept leaving and coming back and leaving and coming back and oh leaving so good and back. but there was a really like times. heartfelt moment there as well when like he turns to he's like you were the best Wolverine and he does all that stuff and I feel like that was like. 
like almost like if this was going to be Hugh Jackman's last outing as Wolverine, that was like Ryan Reynolds, like truly saying you were, you are the best Wolverine. Anybody that comes in, isn't going to touch it. Like fucking thank you for what you've done almost in that, in that scene. And I, which I thought, yeah. I thought was amazing. And then they go into the rapper can't they? We've got to talk about uh, how brilliant Hunter B-15 and Peter's chemistry was at the end in that brief scene. Like, they were just basically <laughs> eye-fucking each other from the start there, weren't they? Yeah, that was hilarious. Oh, who's this? And his, his Deadpool, he's got Ryan, Ryan Reynolds or like uh, Wade Wilson's old Deadpool scene. It doesn't quite fit properly. Like, it's just, <laughs> like, it's it was it was really well set up at the beginning of the movie where it's like hanging in his locker and he like, he whist, like Peter sort of wistfully looks at it. And then he puts it on and obviously comes and saves him at the end. But like, I don't know, like it, it was that like, yeah, Hunter B-15 and, and Peter's chemistry. Like if you get to see any more of that somewhere oh, down the line, I'd be fucking thrilled. That'd be so whatever, good. Whatever, you know, whatever Disney could end up in a Disney Plus show. I mean, I don't think we're going to get Loki season three after Loki season two, but. Right. Uh, what, I got one other little thing I wanted to mention. So, uh, and uh, I've got people with comic book knowledge here, so you're definitely going to help me out on this one. It was not clear to me at all. That, um, well, because they do it once, I believe, that it says, like, the title comes up near the start, Universe 10,005, which yeah. is the Deadpool's um, universe. And then, as we know, the regular MCU is Universe 616. But I didn't think it was very clearly explained that Deadpool travels to 616 when he applies for the job of the Avengers. I was just like, I didn't realize he had traveled. Did I miss something there? Or was it just oh, not very well? I didn't realize explained? that either. No, yeah, it was... shows on the screen. I think it says. It does say 616. Whenever he goes to, ah. to see the Avengers. It's not really explained how he gets there. But... Yeah, yeah, I read up on that. I was like, how did that happen? Apparently it was Cable's time travel device he used. Okay. I just decided not to show it. It was on Apparently. his arm the whole time. It was on his wrist the whole time. Like uh-huh. it was like, but it was I like when when you see his like sh- his suit like shirt jackets pulled down, he's wearing it the whole time, and it's like it's a giant lump under his uh, under it on his oh, wrist. Oh wow, I miss that. So okay. like like that is, but like so don't invoke the, the wrath of Ben's fucking time travel logic, <laughs> because you know like is that hashtag ca- looper is shut up is uh is cables <laughs> is cables time travel device a multi dimensional time travel device right like that's that, that's how that, that's the only way that works right. It probably it, it probably can be. You could probably, probably say that. But in Deadpool 2, it was still a Fox movie. They had no rights to go anywhere else, which means they had to stay in their original <laughs> uh, original um, uh, universe and couldn't universe jump. So okay. I don't know. Now, so here's, an, here's another question about that, though. Right. If, if Deadpool travels to 616 to mm-hmm. become an Avenger, how does that help him with Vanessa? Because she's in... The other other universe. Uh, well, know. that's why he stops doing it. That's why he doesn't go along with it, right? Because he realizes. But why does that? Friends. But why does going to a different universe help him? Like she will still be in that in that universe. If he got into the into the Avengers in six one six, does he just go and get her and be like, "Come and check out what yeah. I'm doing"? I assume that's what he was going to do was go get her. So why? So why in that case didn't he just grab all his friends and go? Well, fuck that universe. We'll just go over here. Like and, and take with him. They couldn't bring him with him. Like, yeah, hey, Ben. I'd... It's comic books. <laughs> Don't use that. Poor, poor excuse. <laughs> <laughs> I expect better from you. Very young man. serious. Don't use that. <laughs> that is almost that is almost like looper level logic of just like oh if that that time travel. Pff, if it gives you a headache, just don't think about it. Shut up. Shut up, all of you. You can't tell Jeff Bridges to shut up, man. You don't can't Jeff, tell the dude to shut up. Okay. But um, Ben does look quite frightening at the minute. If you could see this, uh, listeners. He's literally got like the the blinds and the sun over his face. It's like the most scariest. It's my noir apocalypse, villain. apocalypse now. Look, there you go. Ooh. At the, so at that point, then that means when Deadpool goes back to his uh, universe of 10,005, 10, why can't they pick the easier number to say than ten thousand and five? Uh, but anyway, when he goes back to that universe, that means there are two Logans there. No, because Logan. No, because Logan. Logan from ten thousand and five was the Logan from Logan. He's the Wolverine from Logan. Skeleton in the ground. That's the one that he digs up. But, 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 and I've got a but here for you. The film, and again, this is you're going to be like, fuck you, Neil, on this. Uh, (laughs) Deadpool and Wolverine does supposedly take place in 2024. The events of Logan in 10,005 take place in 2029. Yeah, he uses the time turner to get there to dig him up. Mm, He uses uses Cable's time travel thing to go and pick, to go and get Logan. So So he goes forwards in his own universe to go and get Logan and then the TVA turn up. The TVA pull him out of 
ten thousand and five, right. and that's when that's when all the, the all the other shit starts happening. That's when he grabs the um, TVA's time pad. Is any that clear to anyone else? <laughs> Neil, comic books. I'm going to hurt him. <laughs> Jose, I fly to LA on fucking Wednesday. You, like you get, you got, you're on two strikes, brother. I can easily divert that flight to Florida and come and whoop your ass. Actually, I'll, I'll take you out to dinner if you come by. That's, that's really nice of you, actually. I, I want to come here. Plot <laughs> twist. That's a good chance. He's like, Jose's not phased by me whatsoever. He's just like, yeah, shut up, Limey. Like, hey, Ben, whatever. let's go get dinner. Oh, all right, buddy, yeah. <laughs> this is why Jose is our Peter. <laughs> yes, yeah, because yeah, everyone loves him. Oh, okay, well, gentlemen, I well. believe that's all about the time we have here today. And hopefully this hasn't been the oral equivalent of Deadpool and Wolverine stabbing each other for a full day and night in a Honda. Uh, I'd like to thank our first-time guest, Mr. Rob Stewart from the Stew World Order. Stu, uh, where can people find you on the socials? Uh, the socials are all SWO Productions on everything I'm on. I'm on Twitter. I'm on threads as much as i ever use it i'm on instagram but any social i'm on it's swo productions and the website if i may is swoproductions.com where we have new articles every single weekday and i Damn. must give a quick shit out uh shit out i must shit give out. a quick <laughs> yes please give a shit out i'm very excited for your shit out <laughs> shout out even if you're a fan of buffy stew is writing this amazing retro reviews of Buffy through a modern lens. I've been following them since he started oh. writing them. And through a modern lens, there is some very problematic stuff in it. Mm. Very, very problematic <laughs> stuff, which just, just makes reviews even more funny and worth reading. So, yeah, if you're a Buffy uh, fan, definitely worth checking out on uh, Stu's website at swoproductions.com. I'd like to thank Ben Paul for trying not to shoot me with his twin gold-plated Desert Eagle Mark 19s for suggesting that this isn't the greatest film ever made. And it does have a few more. When did you say that? I cleverly hit it. You, you are fucking dead to me. I'm out. Deadpool. Okay. <laughs> uh, I'd like to thank our resident Longarine, David. And mate, all I can say is very soon beware of... Say it, Ben. Baby knife. <laughs> he was meant to be gone. I, <laughs> I couldn't. <laughs> And of course, I'd like to thank our very own Peter, Mr. Jose Lopez, who put in a group chat that his favourite cameo originally was the Honda, cementing your Peter status before you'd even seen the script. Oh, we mentioned this to you. When you said that, I was just like, it's like karma, karma. Such a Jose thing to say. Such a Jose thing to say. Well, it's been a great time. I hope you've enjoyed. And of course, you can find us all over the place as well. I'm on Twitter at Needy Roads. I forgot the weed, so it's just Needy Roads on Twitter. David occasionally updates on Instagram at We Needy Roads. Ben, tell people about merch. We have merch. It's great. You go to Hawker and search We Needed Roads, and all you'll find is sexy looking Back to the Future style ripoff t shirts that we made with our own bare hands. 70%. Rip off a Back to the Future. So if you wear them out and model them, people will look at you and go, "Oh, oh, why does that look like Back to the Future?" But not. Happens. It's, all it's the a time. conversation starter for sure. Definitely you know, is. We need to make a shirt that says "Make like a tree and get podcast. out of here." Oh. And podcast. <laughs> it's, almost like, like, it's almost like you know a thing or two about merch, isn't it, Ben? Nah, <laughs> that's the next one. That's that's the fall line. That's the winter line we're going to do with t-shirts here. Um, Jose. You are on socials, but we always use this moment for you to just basically advertise your photography business. Where can people find you? Yes, uh, my website is jlopezphotos.com. Uh, that's where you're going to see my wedding inf- wedding photos. Uh, my Instagram, I do. Oh, when did you get married, mate? Uh, pardon? <laughs> <laughs> Neil. How long have you been yeah, waiting to use that? For me. You, were, you were so <laughs> fucking pleased. Like, listeners, if you could hit see Neil's face when he said that, it's like he's been sitting on it for months. <laughs> he finally used it. <laughs> and he's the, the cat that got the cream. <laughs> and Instagram is more por- uh, lifestyles and portraits and, and, and event stuff. Um, it's uh, Jose Lopez Photos. And that's basically what I keep to. I, I don't like to promote anything else. Well, gentlemen, it's been a fantastic pod. Uh, I think almost as much laughter in this pod as about the first 20 minutes of Deadpool Wolverine. Because nothing is as funny as that film right now. And we will see you next time, folks. See you then. We needed roads.